Okay, so we are now on to the presentational lecture, and this is the last lecture that I'll be giving that's related to public speaking. We do still have some coaching days that are coming forward, and then the actual days that you're going to deliver, but this is my last formal day of instruction. So theoretically, by the end of today, I will have given you everything that I could have given you to prepare you for the speeches that are coming at the end of the semester. All right? So we're going to talk about presentational portion of a speech, which is related to visual aids. All right. So first thing that I need you to be thinking about on your visual aids is the size of your visual aids. When I talked to you about delivery, I had mentioned to you that you want to imagine the person that's the furthest back in the room with the worst hearing and imagine, can they still hear me? And if the answer is yes, then you're speaking loud enough. With visual aids, I want you to do something similar. I want you to imagine the person who's in the back of the room with the poorest vision, will they likely be able to see the visual aid? All right, so as an example here, the folks that are towards the back of the room here, can you make out what that is? You can't? Anybody got a guess? Okay, so we got Winnie the Pooh in the row that's one forward. What do y'all think? A possibility on a giraffe? All right. And I'm seeing the kind of thing that I don't want to see when I bring up a visual aid. So some of you are kind of like immediately leaning forward and going, right, and squinting and trying to make it out. And then I've already got almost consensus across the entire back row that you can't make out what that image is. All right. Here's that same image blown up. So yes, it was Winnie the Pooh and friends, right, and not a giraffe, right, but it was a good guess. Thank you for guessing, right. So that's that exact same image. I've just blown it up. And this is much easier to see, and I'm not seeing anybody in the audience now doing this kind of thing. All right? So I want to make sure that the images I use in my PowerPoints or you know, if I'm putting on poster board, whatever the case may be, are large enough for my audience to be able to see. But I have now opened up a new set of problems with this visual aid. So this was a smaller like pixelation image, like uh, the dimensions of it were smaller. And what I've done is I've stretched it. So now it's not terrible, but the stretching of this image is bad to the degree that these characters are a little chubbier than they really are. It's stretched, I think it would be horizontal stretch, more than it should be. All right, and it's also highly pixelated. So this image is not professional, it's not polished. Compare it to this image. Right? So yeah, those colors are a little brighter. The lines on there are much crisper. And so this, compared to this, this is much more professional and polished. And in today's day and age in which we live, if you bring an image like this, it's frustrating because you're literally just a few scrolls away from being able to select this image instead. All right? Most of us are going to get our image through Google Image Search. We're going to put in you know, our search terms go to the image area, and then pull up the images that we see. Make sure that you look at the dimensions of that and how they will project in PowerPoint and get the image that's of the highest quality. All right, so the first image is not necessarily the best image. And you can also use advanced search tools and have Google Image Search arrange images from highest quality to lowest quality so that the highest hits will end up being ones that are very good quality. All right, so think about the size of your image, think about the pixelation of your image, and think about whether or not you're going to have to stretch that image. All right, let's move on. Had a teacher in high school who always used to say that 99% of all genius is being able to locate and then state the obvious. All right, so that's what we're going to do right now. Your visual aids need to aid. I know, mind's blown, right? Yeah. <laughs> Class dismissed. I'm going to leave you on that thought. No, just kidding. Don't leave. All right? So your visual aids need to aid. You need to be asking yourself the question, would my speech be worse if I took the visual aids away? Or is my speech better because I have visual aids? Now, in a speech that you're delivering in this class, it's required that you use three visual aids, one visual aid underneath each main point. Just the same way you need to cite something unique, a unique, unique citation underneath each main point. 
All right, so in this class, it's required that you use a visual aid underneath each main point. Make sure you work hard to, to find that that visual aid is helping. So for instance, if you were doing a speech on motorcycles and you brought up an image of a motorcycle helmet, and then you moved on to your next point and brought up an image of a motorcycle, then brought up your next point and brought up an image of, I don't know, motorcycle tire. It's like, okay, we already know what a helmet looks like. We know what a motorcycle looks like, and we know what a tire looks like, right? So none of that stuff is going to help in your speech. So push yourself and ask yourself, will this image make the speech better? And if the answer is yes, use it. If it isn't, don't. Now, when you're delivering speeches outside of the context of this class, you won't always have to use visual aids because some speeches don't need them. But most speeches will benefit from some visual aids. All right, so ask yourself, does it aid? All right, so here's an example here. What I have here is, I used to see this a whole lot in my classes. I don't see it so much anymore. But students would bring these in, and at this end, there's a, a little tip, uh, the carbon-like substance, lead, that you could take, and if you were to put it down on the paper and apply pressure, you could leave marks. So you could write letters, you could write diagrams, you could do drawings, and it was usually angled in some way because it had been sharpened, and a lot of classes still have sharpeners in them. I rarely see them used anymore. And there was a shaft area usually made out of wood, sometimes made out of plastic if it was a mechanical version of this thing. Then towards the end, there was this metal thing. It crimped on so that it could attach this rubbery sub substance right down here, which if you would twist the device around the other way, and instead use the rubbery end instead of the lead-like end, you could actually erase the marks, and so we called those erasers. We're all dumber for having listened to me. All right? This kind of a visual aid does nothing but insult your audience. Like, we all know what a pencil is. I know many, many of you don't use them anymore, but we already know. Why are you showing me a picture of a pencil? I need something that's going to help make the speech better, okay? So don't insult the intelligence of your audience by bringing forward an image of something that they're already full well acquainted with. All right, let's move on. Charts and graphs can be very, very helpful in a public speech, particularly if there's some kind of complicated subject or uh, maybe you're using a lot of numbers. A visual representation of something complicated or numbers can really help people to understand. So consider adding charts and graphs. The same way that you orally break down, you know, X number of gallons are wasted in dripping faucets. That's equivalent to X number of Olympic-sized swimming pools. That's an oral breakdown. You could also do a visual breakdown of your data. All right? So that can be very, very helpful. So as an example, um, in the early 90s, there was this hit song that came out, and it was remarkable for a few reasons. One, it was because the artist had had a hit like sometime in the mid to late 70s, and then they had another hit in the early 90s, and it was the longest gap between number one hits for an artist ever. And also, it was the longest song to go to number one since like Hey Jude in the late 60s or early 70s or something. All right, and I liked the song, uh, but the lyrics always super confused me. All right, so the words were this. I would do anything for love. Yes. I would do anything for love. Oh. I would do anything for love, but I won't do that. That always confused me. I'm like, you said you would do anything, but you won't do that. Does that mean you'll do anything? You won't do that. I don't get it. What's going on? So let's get a visual depiction of those lyrics, all right? The red is the anything, and the green is the that, all right? So this visually represents Meatloaf's lyrics. So if you have a complicated topic, what you can do, obviously I'm just kidding around here, but what you can do is display it in some visual representation and that will help you to understand, all right? Charts and graphs. When you bring forward your charts and graphs, don't have them be overly complicated, all right? So the general rule in public speaking is always this, keep it as simple as you possibly can and no simpler. All right, your graph should follow that same rule. So don't bring a graph like this up and be like, so obviously we can see the economy is clearly on the uptick. If you have any savings, now nah, would be a great time to purchase as proven by this chart. Really? That's what that part chart proves? I don't know, right? You haven't spent any time telling me what the different colors represent, what the band going up or down represents, and plus there's just so much information on this that who can make sense of it? 
all right? So explain your charts and graphs and make sure that they're not overly complicated. All right? You can get a lot of good charts and graphs from even Google image search, but if it's talking about four things and you only care about two things, build your own chart or graph. PowerPoint has great chart and graph building tools in there. So you can go ahead and take that data that you found in some other table and you know, reduce it down to the data that's most pertinent for your speech, as simple as you can make it. All right, charts and graphs, keep them simple. If you are dealing with graphic images, there's usually a few medical professionals in every class that I teach, and you guys are freaks, right? I don't understand how you operate in the world, right? Anytime something's bleeding or festering or there's a fungus or there's some kind of bug or it's twisted or mangled or bruised or infected, you're all like, ooh, look at that. This is great, Joe. Come over here and look. Yeah, right? I don't get it at all. It makes me nauseous when I look at these kinds of things. But y'all are freaks, and I thank God for you because uh, someday if I'm ever in the hospital, I'll need you, right? All right, so graphic images. If you're going to be using a graphic image in your speech, warn those in the audience that have weaker stomachs that you're about ready to show a graphic image. Give them a chance to avert their eyes, and then once you've shown it and you're done with it, go ahead and tell them that it's safe again. All right, so the warning would look something like this. So for those of you that have weaker stomachs, this next image is a little bit graphic, so you may want to avert your eyes, and I'll let you know when it's safe again. All right, now this next image that I'm about to show is really just a little bit graphic, all right? So if you want to avert your eyes, you can, and I'll tell you when it's safe. All right. So I had a student give a speech on the homeless, and I guess there's a very common condition that the homeless will go through because they're out in uh, rough weather, cold weather. You know, they're not getting a lot of, like, lotions on their skin. They're not great nutrition. They're sleeping on surfaces that are not ideal sleeping surfaces. Activity and stuff is low. And so a lot of times they'll get these, like, really big abscesses and open wounds on their legs. And this is just one example of the kinds of wounds that the homeless people have to deal with. For those of you with weak stomachs, you can now go ahead and lift your eyes up again. All right, so that's what that process will look like. Warn, show, talk, and then tell people when it's safe again. Do not forget to tell people it's safe again. It's one of the most common mistakes that I see. And then I see like three or four people that have really weak stomachs that are sitting down with their eyes closed for like the next five minutes, all right? And so they're not getting the benefit of being able to see the rest of your speech. So remember to remind folks that it's safe again, all right? Here's the other thing. When you're dealing with visual aids, make sure that you're still maintaining good, solid eye contact, right? Your PowerPoint or whatever you're using to display your visual images, that's not the star of the show you are. So keep your eye contact forward. This is what I call wooing your visuals, all right? So I sometimes see people that just fall in love with their visuals, and they just come over, and then they spend the whole rest of their speech just kind of like snuggled up and... You know, here's my first visual, and then they go to their next one and their next visual. And this is all you get from them for the rest of the speech is them snuggled up to their VAs, all right? So this does all that bad stuff that you don't want. You want your eye contact forward to connect with people, convey power, find the friendly eyes. You don't want to break that connection with people. And, you know, this is not supposed to be the star of the show, and you're making it the star of the show. So it's okay to occasionally just glance back and make sure that the PowerPoint or the visuals are showing the thing you expect them to show. Or in some environments, it's really, really easy to just take a monitor and twist it towards you. And then as you're clicking forward, you can look over and make sure that the visual is doing things. And that way your eyes are still forward for the most part. All right? But it's not that big of a deal to look back, but just don't woo your visual. Stay focused forward. All right. Think about the quantity of your visual aids. So the general rule on visual aids is this. Half as many visual aids as the number of minutes that you'll be speaking. That's the general rule. Half as many visual aids as the number of minutes that you'll be speaking. So if you're speaking for 10 minutes, five visual aids. 20 minutes, 10 visual aids. Three minutes, one and a half, which you can round up to two. All right? That's the general rule. That's not a minimum quantity. Some speeches won't need visual aids. The speeches in this class will. But some speeches don't need them, and you know it. If it won't help a speech to have a visual aid, don't have a visual aid. If it will, then have it. All right? In this class, you need them, though. All right? So half as many as the number of minutes you're speaking is a good general rule. Um, I love PowerPoint. PowerPoint has a very, very bad reputation in some circles. 
and I don't think it's because PowerPoint is bad. I think it's because PowerPoint is used very, very poorly. All right. So for instance, in this presentation that I've given today, there's probably been about six or seven different visual images that I've shown really quick. Can you imagine if I had to bring in poster board for each one of those images? You know, it would be a nightmare for me. I'd, you know, have to be hauling it in. My office would be a wreck because I have like, you know, 16 or 17 lectures. If there's 10 or 11 pictures for each one, we're talking 200 poster boards, right? It wouldn't be possible. It's hard to go ahead and control the kill and reveal of them. They take up space, you know. Uh, air conditioner comes on and blows your visual aid off the board. All kinds of things can go wrong with that. They wear down. So PowerPoint is great at displaying visual imagery. That's its chief skill. And a lot of people don't use it to display that chief skill. So I just want to give you one example in which PowerPoint can be really, really strong. Imagine I'm giving a speech on how to cook eggs. All right? So I might, you know, in another environment, I might be able to cook them right in front of you, but the, only the people that are near me are going to see it. I need the people that are far away to kind of get an idea of what's going on, too. So I could show the stages of it. So I might say, okay, first this is how you crack an egg, and then I might show how in this visual image your hands are in the proper position, that kind of thing, right? And then my next visual image, I could say, then you want to whisk it, and you want it to achieve uh, a certain color or a certain texture, or you want to see a certain amount of bubbling. My visual image will show that. Then you want to cook it, and I might talk about how you want to spread it evenly, and you want to start to see a lightening of the color around the edges, and you want to use a cast iron skillet. All of that stuff can be displayed apart from my words in the visual imagery. Right? And then you want to present it. You can talk about how you want to fold it. You want to do it symmetrically. You want to have a little bit of golden brown that's there. You want to garnish it with some color, right? And all of that stuff is shown in the stages with visual images that allow everybody equal access to the image, regardless of where I'm speaking. Even if I was speaking in a stadium, chances are these same images could be used because they would have huge screens with very powerful projectors. Right? So that adapts across the wide variety of audiences as well. So PowerPoint is beautiful, and it's something that I like you to use. I just want you to use it well, and usually the rule is less is more. Right. If you're using PowerPoint, always make sure that you load your PowerPoint and experiment with it on the computer that's going to be actually used for that. Because there's Murphy's Law, if it can go wrong, it will go wrong, and that is the truth. All right. So until you've got an environment down where you know it backwards and forwards, if it's a new environment, new computer, maybe a new way of building a PowerPoint, test it out in the environment that you're going to speak. Um, you know, you, you don't know. Maybe that day there's construction going on outside. You weren't expecting it. Well, if you had gone in earlier, you would have found that out, and then maybe you could have got a lapel mic and had some kind of artificial amplification so that the audience would still be able to hear you. So go into your environment, find out on things. PowerPoint is not read the same way by every version of PowerPoint. There are certain fonts that are available in new, newer versions that are not in older versions. And maybe that font was important. So if you'd gone in earlier, you could have went ahead and loaded that font. Right? So find out. In this class now, when you deliver uh, your speeches individually but as a group, all of your visuals will be integrated into one PowerPoint. You might be choosing like you want like neon green kind of backgrounds in your slides, and you might like a, a brown kind of design. And if so, that's OK. You can have different designs, but they'll be integrated into one PowerPoint. And I'll expect that all that stuff is loaded, and we're ready to hear you speak within two minutes after the start of class. Right? So build these PowerPoints in advance, and make sure that somebody from your group is here early to load these, stuff, load these uh, PowerPoints up in advance of the day that we're speaking. Okay. All right, so test it out on the computer. If it can go wrong, it will go wrong. Control the reveal of any of your visual aids. When you're up here speaking, you want to make sure that you don't bring out a visual aid too early. Because if you do, I call it the gravity of the pretty, your visual aids are more attractive often than your words are. And I'm starting to see that just a little bit as I look around the room. Eyes have been averted several times towards the map. And some of you had totally tuned me out and started to look at nothing but the visual aid. All right? It's the gravity of the pretty. And I don't know exactly what might be going through your mind. But you know, things like, mm, where's the 84 at? 
Okay, there's the 84. Where's Boise? Okay, there's Nampa. That's probably where I live. Oh, I remember when I was seven years old. We went up to Silverwood. Where was that up? You know, and these kinds of things happen with that visual image. You start to engage with the visual imagery, and it sends you to that proverbial beach and away from the actual words. And this is supposed to be the sidekick, not the superhero. You're Batman, this is Robin. Not it's Batman and you're Robin, all right? It's the sidekick, so make sure that it doesn't attract too much attention. Control the reveal. And then control the kill. The rule is this. When you're ready to start talking about it, show the image. When you're done talking about it, take the image away. All right? That's the rule. When you're ready to talk about it, show it. When you're done talking about it, take it away. You don't want to leave it up there too long because people will disengage with you and they'll go to that. All right? And then related to this, when you show your image, make sure you spend time with it, all right? So don't say this. So I believe that we could actually improve traffic patterns in the state of Idaho dramatically if we would just go ahead and build a major thoroughfare starting from Glens Ferry up to the north. So I think that this could be a key. Like, that was way too little time, all right? I should have been spending a little bit more time on that image to let you contextualize. Okay, right now, the only major thoroughfare that runs all the way through the state of Idaho is the 84. And I propose that in order to get from southern Idaho to northern Idaho, we ought to build another major thoroughfare starting in Glens Ferry until we arrive up in, I don't even know what's a silly, maybe Wallace or something, right? Spend a little time so that people don't feel as though the image was almost like a disco or something. All right. Then, do not read your slides word for word. Of course, in this class, you won't be using your VAs for words anyhow. But in the future, don't put a lot of text on a slide, then turn around and read it. It's annoying. And besides that, your audience can read faster than you can, and they will just finish ahead of you anyway. How many of you finished ahead of me? OK. And this is usually the rule. Most of us can read much faster than we listen. We can read much faster than we listen. So what you want to do is make sure that you're keeping your audience engaged with you. If I do this on every slide, What's going to happen is pretty soon you will no longer listen to me. You'll just read ahead, get through all the text that's on the slide, and then mentally check out until I switch to the next slide. Right? And this is one of the reasons why PowerPoint gets a really bad reputation. And it's the way that some of your instructors teach. And it hurts because you're not listening to them anymore. You don't need them anymore. And it's even maybe a little bit upsetting when they load their PowerPoints in the Blackboard shell as well. And you can ask yourself, why do I even come to class? If the instructor's just going to read their slides and they make their slides available to me, why don't I just read those at home and save the gas money? Right? So this is a really bad technique that I don't want you to use. All right. Just remember on these visual aids, the key point here is less is more, you are the show. There is some comfort in building busy visual aids. That's one reason why we do it. We put all the text up there or try to turn things into an automated slideshow or put tons of visual aids up there because we find comfort in this. When all that stuff is up there and people are looking at it and not us, it makes us feel a little bit more comfortable. You know, because we're all insecure in some ways. You know, maybe I feel like my ears are way too big. And when you're looking at me and giving me eye contact, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, he's totally thinking about my ears. I remember in second grade, they used to call me Dumbo. He's thinking of me as Dumbo right now. Why are you so mean, right? We go through this internal dialogue when eyes are on us, and we feel like people are thinking things about us that they're not thinking about us. Uh, but we feel insecure. And when their eyes are over here, it's almost like all this liberty. I can do whatever I want right now. Nobody even knows because they're looking at the visual aid. But that's the exact opposite of what we want our visual aids to do. We're not here to supplement the visuals. The visuals are there to supplement our oration. You are the show. Okay, that's what I formally want to teach you about visual aids. All right. I think there is a time and a place for you to use audio and or video in your presentations. And PowerPoint gets a little bit better every generation at integrating those things. In this class, because we have such a short speech, I forbid it. No multimedia, no moving images, no audio integrated into your presentations. For a couple of reasons. One, I'm trying to get you to build up your skills on oration. I don't want your video to do the speaking for you. I want you to do it for yourself. All right, and then also, it's problematic because if it can go wrong, it will go wrong, particularly when there's video or audio integrated.
Um, and then the last reason is it's a short speech. You got to go five to eight, is it? Five to nine? I can't remember. Five to eight or five to nine. It's on the, the sheets of exactly what time I want from you. So I don't want you to spend a minute of that with somebody else doing the work. All right. If it's a longer, like you know, 30-minute presentation, it's perfectly appropriate to bring in some vibrant media, and even helpful. The way that you see teachers lecture, and you even see me doing it, like there's a bulleted word, and sometimes there's an image there just to supplement it. And I'm trying to do that for my visual learners so that they have something to connect visually to the word. Um, that's the way I do it. Text, picture, new text, new picture, new text, new picture. That's lecture format. And lecture speaking is different than the kind of public speaking that I'm getting you to do on your informs and persuades. So I ask you to put the preference on the visual and if you can get away with not using any words at all, get away with it. All right, I'm not looking for bulleted words. I'm looking for visual imagery that supplements the orated words.